with me, Father John Passau, today. Father, uh, do you miss Guyana? I mean, you've been working in Trinidad for a while, so do you miss her? Well, it's, it's difficult. I mean, like, I get asked that all the time, but I, I, I try not in my life to miss places anyway. Okay. <laughs> I might miss people sometimes, but places, you know. I've always had, uh, even before I left Guyana or, or times when I had to study abroad, I've always had the thing that wherever I am, I make the best of it. So I don't go about kind of moping and thinking, well, I miss. So in that sense, no, I mean, home is always home. And I enjoy every moment when I get to come home. But um, in terms of missing or so, I, I, I never really dwell too much on that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Father. Um, you have been the secretary for the AEC. What does that entail? Well, I mean, when I left Guyana originally, I left not uh, to be General Secretary of the AEC, but I left um, to take up the appointment as Judicial Vicar for the Metropolitan Tribunal in Port of Spain. Um, since then, that court has become now an interdiocesan court, which takes in eight dioceses, starting from Antigua down to Guyana. I'm still serving as Judicial Vicar of that court. Um, uh, but I'm hoping that I can be released from that shortly. Since then, um, nearly two years ago, the bishops of our conference, the Antilles Episcopal Conference, um, appointed me general secretary of that conference. And so the secretariat for the, for the AEC is housed in Trinidad in the Archdiocese of Port of Spain. And so my well, my other job at the moment as AEC General Secretary entails being a General Secretary. So okay. I'm basically um, at the service of the bishops of our conference, of the Conference of Bishops, um, and doing everything that a General Secretary does, like you might have equivalents to a General Secretary of CARICOM, General Secretary of the European Union, that kind of thing, which is really, um, really helping the bishops in their role um, and particularly in the conference, there are certain issues that as a conference of bishops that they have to take up. So I'm at their service, so yes. Okay, that's a lot of responsibilities, Father. Um, how do, where did you get the inspiration from? Well, yes, I mean, I think every, every job, if you want to call it, I don't see it as a job, but every um, vocation, every ministry for us, carries with it responsibility, no matter if it's at parish level or diocesan level or, or wider as in my case right now. Um, and I think we all have to have the same inspiration in that it has to be grounded in our relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the one who calls us um, and who invites us into that relationship with our God. And so I think that the inspiration has to come from there, from our relationship with our God in Jesus the Christ. And, um, and so for me, um, whatever job I've done at any level or any time of my life has always been grounded in my relationship with God, which one can speak of as prayer. So prayer is central and gives me the, the inspiration and the help that I need, I think, to function in whatever role that I'm called to. Father, you have been very quiet in our diocese. Are you just like working behind the curtains? Well, no, I mean like after I left the diocese here of Georgetown, I'm still a priest of this diocese. I'm still incarnated here in this diocese, so I'm, I haven't left in that sense. But because I have been moved to a, a different country and a different place to, to assume roles, um, but I, I don't think that I'm involved in day-to-day you know, runnings of this diocese anymore. Once I did serve as vicar general here and judicial vicar, um, and uh, in different other ways, uh, but I'm not in that immediate role anymore. So in that sense, if you speak of it of being quiet, I still am one of the consultants to our bishop here, Bishop Francis, and from time to time I I am called upon to to give consultation there. You know, but. But no, so if, if that is behind the scenes, then fine, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, 
Vocations to phrase it. It's been a challenge here, especially in our diocese. Um, what would be the response from the AECS bishop? How do they react to that? Well, I think, I think generally, I mean, vocations throughout the world, not just simply here in Guyana or even in the Caribbean, but there has been a lull in vocations to the priesthood and religious life throughout the world, I think, even though certain parts of the world, I think, are seen increases. And there is seeming to be a, a, a movement taking place there now, an upward movement again, but nothing like what, what we used to have, you know. Um, for a long time, we have experienced here in Diana a, 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 a lull in vocations and so on. And it certainly is, yes, of concern to the church generally. Um, the bishops of our region, the Conference of Bishops, have certainly have had it on their agenda. It's a, in fact, I, I'm right now working with the AEC Commission on Vocations. We are planning a, a conference, a vocations conference in 2017, to which all the dioceses in the AEC will be taking part, hopefully. Um, so it is of concern, and it's of major concern, yes. But I think the responsibility of that is, is the responsibility of all. Certainly our bishops, yes, and they are aware of that. But in every diocese too, and in, you know, in every parish, you know, everybody must be concerned about vocations and vocations cross board. Vocations certainly to, to priesthood, religious life, but also vocations to other ministries, vocations to, to, to the lay ministry, for example, and so on. In some dioceses, we have married deacons that also is a vocation in the church. So yes, overall I think, and I think it, we have to start seeing it as the responsibility of everyone. So every Catholic must feel the responsibility, I think, for promoting, encouraging, inspiring vocations in our church. Yeah. Okay. Um, Father, you're the president of the Antilles Canon Law Society. Uh, most of us are not well aware of this or of what the Canon Law Society of the Caribbean is like. What do they do? Yeah, well, well the Canon Law Societies can be found throughout the world in the Catholic Church. Uh, okay. uh, canon Law is the, is, the, is the law of our church. Right, that's referred to as canon law. It's a coded law system. So we have a, a book of laws, coded laws that, that govern the, the life of our church. So there are those who are who study canon law, as somebody will study civil law, you know, okay. that's lawyers out there and so on, attorneys and so on. So in our church we have those who have studied the church's law and so they're referred to as canon lawyers. Now it, as I said, there are societies which would be a grouping of such lawyers in different places. So you have the Canon Law Society of Canada, they have the Canon Law Society of America, you have the Canon Law Society of Great Britain and Ireland, you have the Canon Law Society of Australia, and you have the Canon Law Society of the Antilles. So the Antilles Canon Law Society is a grouping of persons who have studied canon law and persons who are working with canon lawyers within our tribunals in the, in the Antilles who come together to form a society. And the purpose of that society is to, is to help one another um, reflect on the law, um, share resources and so on so that it, it's it's like every society i suppose every um um grouping or, or so you you come together for to help each other you see so the canon law society of the antilles is is a grouping of canon lawyers but also there's there are many people who are members of our society who are not canon lawyers per se but they are involved in the tribunals and so they, they they come together to form this society yeah so that's the Antilles Canon Law Society right, which is of this region okay. this, this. all right um, father if someone in Guyana wants to know about an issue whether it collides with the Canon Law what do they do or who do they contact well well okay I mean the thing is like uh, right now we do not have any Canon lawyers here in Guyana except okay. myself oh. uh, I'm not resident here but um, 
but we have other persons who serve on the tribunal and who have had experience and built up experience through that that ministry so that they become knowledgeable about certain aspects of our law. Um, the Canon Law Society of the Antilles, as I said, are comprised of such persons. So there are people who are trained in Canon Law and those who are associated with Canon Lawyers and with tribunals. Um, usually in every diocese there would be an office set up even with the interdiocesan tribunals every one of the dioceses has an office set up which would be an instructional office the main office of the tribunal is the seat of the tribunal which is in Port of Spain at the moment Trinidad mm -hmm. but every diocese belonging to that court would have an instructional office so Georgetown the diocese of Georgetown Guyana has an instructional office, it's housed in the bishop's office, where the bishop's office is. Um, and so if anybody wants to find out, or so I suppose they can call in there and they will be guided accordingly. Now, most of the work that the tribunals in, in the Antilles deal with, I said most, not all, but most, would be matters associated with marriage. Okay. So marriage cases. Um, when someone, when a marriage breaks down and um, someone, one of the parties may apply to the civil courts for a civil divorce. But the civil divorce is an instrument, a legal instrument that the state uses to end a marriage. Our church, the Catholic Church, does not accept any instrument as ending a marriage. And that's why when two persons marry, they say, on the day they get married, that forever, until okay. death do us part, okay. their commitment is a lifelong commitment. Sometimes marriages break down and um, they have a civil divorce, but we still recognize the marriage as standing. So a Catholic will then petition the tribunal of the church to examine that marriage to see if in fact from the very inception it was not a marriage. So we're not doing, it's not like divorce, where divorce just ends the marriage. But this investigates the marriage to determine it from the very beginning when that marriage began, that there were grounds. In other words, this was never a marriage from the beginning. Okay. Right? So if somebody, for example, stands up there at their wedding day and say, yes, I take you, you know, as my wife or my husband, but never had the intention of being faithful to the person. Now, according to our teaching on marriage, that will be not a marriage because the, 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 the commitment one makes is to be an exclusive relationship where you give yourself to, totally to this person for the rest of your life, excluding all others. So if you don't intend to be faithful to that person, then that could never have been a marriage. You never committed to such a relationship. So there are other instances, I'm just using that one. So a declaration of nullity is going through a legal process, examining that marriage, putting it under the microscope as it were, to determine if when that couple got married, they never intended or you know, there was a defect in the consent that they gave at the time they were married. If the tribunal can, through their investigation, and the evidence presented determined that, then they declare that marriage null. Okay. Therefore, in the eyes of the church, while you have the semblance of a marriage, that it was never really a marriage based on the church's teaching. Now, some people have problems with that as regards children. So people normally would ask, well, what that makes our children? Because people would have had children out of the relationship. Um, and we do not deal with the civil effects of marriage. So. The civil divorce deals with that, but um, so no, we don't make because we declare the marriage null now, based on the evidence presented. We don't. That doesn't um, make your children illegitimate. Okay. I think children are always gifts from God, mm -hmm. and I wish we could learn to deal with them as such. You know, every child is a gift that yes. God gives us, and it matters not of anything else. I think that we should always recognize that they are gifts and deal with that as such. Yeah. Okay, Father. Um, Father, for example, say, um, 
The person did have an intention of marrying the person, but something went wrong along the way. That's and they seek annulment. They wouldn't be able to get well, that. Well, the thing is that I mean, like the, the, the evidence, like you might say that the person had the intention of marrying for mm -hmm. life, for example, or being faithful. There are all different kinds of grounds, you see. But maybe they never had the intention to for the good of the spouse. Oh. So if, for okay. example, as we have in many cases in in in, our, in the Caribbean, somebody enters marriage, but it's not really with the intention that the other person's good is considered. They, they want a slave to work for them and to and to bear children for them and and to look after their home and to feed them and to wash their clothes, but they don't want. You know, it's not for that person's good. We have many cases where there's physical or verbal or emotional abuse. Right? Okay. Uh, I mean, if, if somebody is beating their wife morning, noon, and night, is that for the person's good? I mean, that obviously can't be a marriage. You know? So it's not just, I just use the wanting of, the, of not being faithful, but there are many grounds that it will have. And very often it's difficult to understand because you can't get into somebody's head to determine what they intend, but their actions might guide you. Okay. So yeah. we examine and the evidence has to be presented. If somebody says to me, yes, I love my wife, but every day I'm beating them up. Is that love? You know? So the actions as they live their commitment to marriage will help us to determine what they intended. Yeah. Father, when you have these meetings, um, are the public invited or is it just the priests? Well, but just let's not mix it up. Like the Canon um, Law Society will of of the Antilles will uh -huh. be having. They have an annual convention. Okay. So every year we have a convention, um, and last year, for example, we were in the in the diocese of Williamstad, in the island of Aruba. This year, the convention is happening here in Guyana, in Georgetown. Um, so delegates will be coming from throughout the Caribbean to this conference. I think we have something like nearly 40 persons will be coming in for that. Um, that convention is, of course, for members, yes, primarily members. So members of the Canon Law Society. There are some um, things that we would open to, like this one that we are having, um, based on what we are doing at the conventions, papers being presented, you know, and so on, we might open it to others. So we will be opening it to priests and religious and, and some, in some instances, lay persons who are involved in certain aspects of our life as church. So it depends on what we are doing at the convention mm -hmm. and if we're going to be able to open it. So this one, we're definitely going to be opening it to some people, yes. Okay. Um, we, we're going to be one of the things we're going to be looking is at some new norms that the Holy Father brought out last December, December the eighth. They were promulgated um, that concerns um, marriage cases, particularly declarations of nullity. So we're going to be looking at that, and we would like our priests to become more aware of them and how they can help in the work and this ministry of of declarations of nullity and so on. Um, so yes, we will be opening it to some, but it's not an open thing like to the whole public oh. can come to. It's not okay. like that, a lecture being given and the whole public is invited. Right. Um, so yes, yeah, so that convention is happening this year here from the 26th to the 30th. Actually, 26th, which is the Monday, I think, of September, mm -hmm. and the 30th are travel days. So we actually work on it from the 27th to the 29th. That's when we're going to be actually having the working. So. Delegates are, are traveling in on Monday the 26th, and they'll be starting to leave on Friday the 30th of September this year. Um, at the moment, I wear also that hat as president of the Canon Law Society of the Antilles. Um, and this would be my last term, I think. So I have one more year to go. It's a two-year term, and I've okay. served one already. So this is my second term as president. Um, and so I'm hoping that I, I'll be out after that. <laughs> um, okay. So there are younger guys coming up that yes. need to take on responsibility. But um, so yes, i be here. The executive that I have serving with me as president are all in Guyana here. Okay. So they're, they're members of the tribunal here in, in Georgetown. So yeah, we are working hard on that convention right now. One of the things is that we are trying to raise some funds to help us. Oh. So there's a raffle, I think, on the local group here has been promoting it. 
uh, the sales not going too good from what I've been told this oh. morning. So. Uh, if you could help, I think there's there's some nice attractive prizes. There's a raffle we are running. Oh, what is the what is the cost for a ticket? I think it's a hundred dollars a ticket oh. or somewhere. But there's there's some nice prizes prizes to be won, and I really would encourage like to encourage all parishes to get involved, buy a ticket, and you're going to be hopefully winning a prize, but also you'll be contributing towards the work of which is an important work in our region. Um, so yes, the local hosting diocese has to help in terms of putting on the convention so there are certain expenses there yes yeah. so so we would like to appeal to the parishioners throughout the diocese if you can support us by by helping us to sell those tickets for the raffle as soon as possible i think we we had a meeting this morning and i think that um it's likely we're going to postpone the drawing of the raffle to a later date because we need okay. to sell the the tickets yes so that's one way you could help. Um, there's going to be an opening mass for the convention, which is going to happen on the Tuesday afternoon. Um, that that would be the twenty seventh in the cathedral at five o'clock, and we invite all to come out for that. The Archbishop of Port of Spain, who is the Metropolitan, but also he's also the bishop responsible as the liaison bishop in the Antilles Conference with the Canon Law Society. So he will be coming in and he will be giving a feature address to the convention. So he will be the, the main celebrant of that opening mass, I think, or at least celebrating with our own bishop here, Bishop Francis. So the mass, the opening mass is open to all. Everybody can come. So, and that's happening on the 27th. It's a Tuesday in the afternoon, five o'clock in the cathedral. Thank you, Father, for sharing all this with us. Um, before we leave, would you like to leave any message with our viewers? Well, I think I, I, I can't give you any better message than the message of Jesus himself. And I think it's always a call to live our discipleship. You know, um, I, I was visiting the Diocese of Dominica the other day, and um, the bishop and I were, he took me to a meeting he was having with with a parish where they have no priest and he was trying to organize it and so on because the priest who was serving there had to leave and um, and you know I was saying to them as an outsider listening in the meeting you know sometimes we can get all worked up at running church you know doing this doing that and all of us priests sometimes religious sisters and, and lay persons and you know we have to do this and do that and but I think that the most important thing is not so much running church, but it's about being church. And, and I think that that's the challenge to us, that in everything we do, at every parish level, in every little community, that we have to learn to be church. In other words, to live as disciples of Jesus today. And he calls us, he says, there's only one, one law really, and one command that he gives us is to love. And if, I think if we could get that right, life would be terribly big, big, <laughs> yes. very different. Eh? Not just simply for the church, but for the, for the country, for the world, if we can truly love as Jesus teaches us to love. And so my, my, my message to everyone of our viewers is to, is to continue to move in that direction, to continue to call yourself, remind yourself, always of that call of Jesus to live that commandment of love. Um, I think that that holds the key. So let's be church. Let's live as Jesus taught us to live, with love, with compassion, with mercy. This year is the year of mercy. Um, with forgiveness. You know, we must be able to embrace each other and heal each other. Um, and if we do, I think we can put an end to all the different confusions around you know and, and that is not meaning that we're going to be same or alike we're going to be different we're going to look different or we're going to sound different or we're going to be different but we can live together in harmony in unity if we truly follow what jesus calls us to love one another oh thank you so much father for that okay. you're welcome Bye.